ready to talk about our favorite movie villains. Welcome back, everybody, on this April Fool's Day. We are here on the Stereo app. I am your host, Rob Fishbeck. With me, as always, the amazing Legoland. We're going to break it all down for you today. Be talking about our favorite movie villains. We've got lists. We've talked, you know, off air. And uh, message us in your th- questions, comments, and concerns. Your favorite movie villains. Underrated ones, overrated ones, and everything in between. How was that for an intro after I had my coffee? Pretty good, bro. I, I had See? quite a bit of coffee. I don't think I could have done it as well as that. But I'll start with my number one, number one. Let's just get this one out there in the air. I'm sure as people uh, join in, they will start to talk about this character as well. It's my number one villain of all time for multiple reasons. I mean, obviously this was an Oscar-winning performance. 2008's Best Supporting Actor from The Dark Knight, that would be Heath Ledger's The Joker. Obviously the greatest movie villain of all time as far as I'm concerned for a multitude of reasons. Uh, Stole the Show, I think, is an understatement for one of the greatest movies ever made. He walks in the room and takes all the air out of it. So, yeah, it was definitely a phenomenal performance. And what's really great about that is it's one of the rare instances where the villain wins, which always makes it more impactful. And in terms of the, you know the pop culture, is that guys, this is definitely one of the most memorable. Uh, and prolific and notorious movie villains for sure. 100%. And, you know, obviously, how do, I, how do I put this exactly? There's really not much to say because at the end of the day, it's been talked about, talked about, talked about. I'm pretty sure most people would consider him one of the greatest movie villains. Uh, I remember when the American Film Institute did their list, like, 15 years ago, you know, I, I glazed over it the other day. They did as heroes and villains, 50 of each. And I look back at that list now and go, wow, that really could use some updating because what's interesting is at least three of the people that I wrote down and I probably wrote down like seven or eight movie villains are from the last 15 years. And I think they could dance toe to toe with, you know, some of the classics that have been around for a very long time in, you know, and some of which we'll talk about as well. That's interesting. All of mine are really old. <laughs> cool. Cool. So we're going to have yeah. a pretty uh, eclectic list then. I'm excited. Okay. As it, as it is, uh, I mentioned that I have an honorable mention and as it is April Fools, I just got to throw this out there because people have been joking about this since the movie came out. And so my honorable mention is Star-Lord, specifically in Infinity War. Obviously, he's not actually a villain. I just think it's funny that people make that joke. So I thought it'd go in on it. Um, I would say biggest F up goes to Star-Lord. Um, but for my first actual pick for, uh, you know, favorite movie villain, it's Nurse Ratched from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And very much like your first pick, this is an instance where she, as the villain, totally fucking wins. She's just this cold, uncaring woman who who enjoys having power over these men who don't really get many options and choices in life because of their situations and her behavior leads to poor effing billy bibbit taking his own life and to whatever jack nicholson's character's name was getting a lobotomy and then at least chief gets away but it's it's terrible and there's no repercussions for her actions she just gets to continue on doing what she's doing and you know ruining other people's lives and that's and it's it's she's ruining people who are not in a position that they can stand up for themselves which is just even more wretched it's and my god her stare it chills me to the bone louise fletcher deserved every single ounce of that oscar statue that she took home 
with the big prize win, one foot of the Coos Nest swept the Oscars for the year 1975. It is obviously we had talked about this off air because we wanted to make sure that we we didn't come in with the same lists. And she is definitely easily one of my favorites as well. I mean, where to start? I think you've covered the gist of it. But for me as a child watching Cuckoo's Nest for the first time, I, I was in sixth grade. I'll never forget. I watched it on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, I'm watching the television. And just every time she came on camera, you know, when you're 12 years old, you don't necessarily understand everything you understand as an adult. And every time she came on camera, I cringed. I was just like, why is she back? Like, why can't we just focus on Jack Nicholson and like Danny DeVito and Christopher Lloyd? There's all this other cool stuff going on in this movie. And it's like every time she walked in the room, you just cringe. Obviously, that was Milo Sporman's point, you know, when they made the movie. But then on the rewatch, it just you really start to appreciate how amazing of an of, of character work that is if that makes any sense it, it's just oh, so absolutely. it's so next level definitely it's very subtle there's not a lot of there's it's not overacting it's just a very subtle portrayal of this character to your point she uses a lot of her um she acts a lot with her face it's it's in, in an just expressionist Exactly. Role. It's very much an expressionist role. Exactly. Okay. What, uh, is, let's, what is your next pick, Rob? My next pick, my number two, uh, is a census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Uh, let's rewind the clock and go back to 1991 one of the greatest movies ever made all the movies that we've talked about so far all actually in my top 20 favorite films jonathan demi's 1991's the silence of the lambs with anthony hopkins and jodie foster it is oh what you know and the sequels were what they were they were fine i i Honestly, like other than Silence of the Lambs, would rather just watch 1986's Manhunter, where Brian Cox played Hannibal Lecter. But Hopkins' performance in The Silence of the Lambs is nothing short of astounding. It's another performance where, you know, he's not in the whole movie. He's not the lead. Technically, Jodie Foster is the lead. But he just steals every scene that he's in. It's so it's become so iconic. And I think that's probably going to be a common thread on both of our lists is the icon status of many of these villains, how they have become so well known and parodied and talked about in pop culture and in the zeitgeist of, uh, you know, American culture in general. Hannibal Lecter fits that, fits that description 100% as far as I'm concerned. What say you? Definitely. And and with what you were saying is, you know, these movies, your movie is only as good as the villain. And these, these movies all have these iconic villains. And of course, they're all such famous and remembered movies because of these villains. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Where would you put Hannibal Lecter on your list? So I actually specifically left off horror movies and I do consider Science of the Lamb to be a horror movie. Um, but as do I. He, he's, you know, maybe he's definitely top 50, I don't know, top 25. I'd have to think about it really hard. Villains or movies in general? Villains because if we're if we're putting Hannibal in, we're putting horror movies in, and then I gotta really think about it because so many horror movie villains didn't get on the list before him. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, See, like, that's... Oh, I God. mean, xenomorphs. I didn't put xenomorphs on my list, but like, they would be very close to number number one. I'd really have to think about it. Xenomorphs really? You would put Xenomorphs on there. That's interesting. 
very high up on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers, Bruce, the shark from Jaws, and yeah, yeah. Hannibal. Um, yeah, there, there'd be a lot. But if we're including horror movies with the ones I already have on the list, which is already kind of long, if I'm being honest. <laughs> See, to me, what's interesting is, you know, yes, do I consider The Silence of the Lambs a horror movie? Yes, but I will also say that, you know, similar with Jaws, the, the Silence of the Lambs at the end of the day is still a drama as far as I'm concerned, psychological thriller yeah. possibly. Uh, similar to Jaws. Jaws is a, you know, action adventure drama and a horror film second. The Silence of the Lambs is a horror film second as well. You could argue the same point for the first Halloween movie. I don't know about its sequels, nor any of the other slasher movies. But once you get into the horror realm, I think that's an entirely different conversation. So I understand why you left that off your list. Yeah. Uh, your we've got a message. Quite long. What's that? So the list was already quite long, and I'll go ahead and play the message. Go ahead. Oh. One of my favorite villains, and I think this may be on somebody else's list, maybe, uh, is uh, Emperor Commodus from Gladiator, uh, portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix. Gladiator was my favorite movie of all time before The Dark Knight came out, so. Yeah, uh, for sure. I've not seen Gladiator probably since I was like 13 or 14. I liked it. it was, it's not one of my favorite movies. It's fine. Have you seen Gladiator? What are your thoughts on that? Nah, nah I, I watched some of it. That's just really not my kind of movie. That's why I asked. I figured that probably wouldn't be up your alley. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, we all know Joaquin Phoenix can, can play menacing people and play villains very well. So sure. definitely, definitely very good brand for Joaquin. All right, moving forward, what would be your next pick? My next pick would be... Mr. Potter from It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, man, man, it's man, another Mr. instance. Mr. Potter. <laughs> it's another instance where a car a villain wins. Although in this case, I've talked about this before, and I talk about it a lot because It's a Wonderful Life is a top five favorite movie for me. In this particular instance, not only does he win, but it doesn't seem like he wins, which is even more nefarious. He gets away with $8,000, which would be comparable to about $110,000. So that's one one zero 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 zero. That's a six-figure salary just for accidentally bumping into George Bailey's uncle forgetful ass uncle that dude's the serious villain freaking Thanks. dude lost eight thousand bucks so yeah he gets away with the money um he has all these people living in his poor houses and he's he's got them stuck in in the vicious cycle of capitalism which really blows and apparently he made it through the great depression totally unscathed which is that's that's true villainy right there uh, yeah, he's a terrible dude. And he gets poor George Bailey to almost kill himself. Like, that's... How evil is that? By g putting this man into a position where he's ready to take his own life to ensure that the people, that his friends and family, and specifically his family, aren't going to be in trouble and that he's not going to go to jail. And specifically that his uncle's not going to go to jail. So he's about to kill himself. Obviously he doesn't because of the interference with the Angel Clarence. But Mr. Potter almost drove his his competition to death. J Dude is awful. And uh, is it John Barrymore? Played him yes. very well. Couldn't agree more. It's a Wonderful Life. I watch every single Christmas season and do my impression pretty much through mid-spring. Every single year, I like to bust out the Jimmy Stewart <laughs> Jimmy Stewart's great year round. Wah, 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 wah. Cl Cl Clarence, I, I just want to live again. Clarence, I just want to live again. So, uh, yeah, there's that. We've got a message to play. Lego, would you like to play this awesome message we've got coming in? Sure. Oh. Hey, guys. Um, favorite villains. Uh, wow. A long list. Um, three that come to mind to me, or actually four, is... Uh, Kaiser Soze from Usual Suspects. Yeah. Kevin Spacey played that 
immaculately. Um, also, another villain played by Kevin Spacey I like is John Doe in the movie Seven with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. Um, I also like Tyler Durgan played by Brad Pitt in uh, the movie Fight Club. Um, I don't know if he's really a villain or a hero or an anti-hero, but he, he's definitely got villainous <laughs> tendencies. And um, I also like Edward Norton's performance in Primal Fear. Um, yes. With Richard Greer. Um, he played a villain pretty well in that. Oh, how can I forget also Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Wow. I, so much to break down uh, right there. Okay. Thank you so much for your message. Yes, definitely Kaiser Soze. Definitely. Well, I, was say, okay. I have Kaiser Soze and John Doe on my list. <laughs> uh, I've got John Doe on my list. So why don't we break those down first? Yeah. Okay. So, well, actually, do you mind if we do? I'll just talk about Primal Fear real quick first, yes. actually. Edward Norton did such a good job in Primal Fear. And when you get to the end, spoilers, it's very similar. He's got a weird typecast. I don't know what it is about him playing characters with DID. Um, but it, it, it turns, except he doesn't, but he does. So it turns out at the end of the movie, when you think they've spared this poor, you know, altar boy who's been abused by his priest, it turns out, well, they kind of did because it's not like that didn't happen but he was far more evil than he let on. And when they, they do that snap, you get the reveal that he wasn't as 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 kind as he, he made himself out to be and he wasn't ill. It's kind of a fuck you to the lawyer, which was done so, so well. Uh, did you, Have you seen Primal Fear? Uh, yeah, so my aunt, shout out to my aunt Karen, she, her uh, casting company did all the extra casting for that. That's a, it's another Chicago orientated movie shout out chicago illinois uh that cast is stacked i've probably seen this movie three to five times all the way through and every time i watch it it's just like how is this not ranked far like it should be up there i think with some of the other you know great films of the last 30 years 40 years but it's not talked about enough. I think it's severely underrated. The performances are all 10 out of 10, knocking them out of the park. And you're right about Edward Norton. He has this very interesting typecast where he always plays this, like, I mean, creep, for lack of a better yeah. word. He, yeah. He, he can always play this creep. I don't know. If they were to, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but Movies like that are so 90s that yes. I don't see them making movies like they don't make movies like Primal Fear anymore. They don't make movies like Seven anymore, which we're going to get to or Fight Club. And it's unfortunate because like they're just, you know, the world that we live in now with the franchises and the sequels and the well, it's it's only going to make so much in the theater. So we'll just put it on streaming as to where this was a time, a movie like Primal Fear, it might not slay it in the box office, but between cable television and home video, I think that's where it got a lot of its circulation. Yeah, I totally agree. And also some movies just kind of fall under the radar. I think that might have been one of his his first performances as well in a, in a film. Sure, for sure. So it was, it was just, it didn't have, it has name recognition now, but I don't think it did then. Right. Right. Uh, so let's talk about John Doe then real quick. Cause I mean, yes. top, top five favorite films of all time for me is seven. It's mind bending. What, what makes the movie work so well is that spoiler alert once they reveal who john doe is and you see it's kevin spacey a young kevin spacey this was before a lot of his big movies came out he wasn't nearly as known as he is now this was also before the usual suspects i believe i believe um you see him and it all makes sense it all makes sense that this guy is is who is out doing all of these things, creating all of this chaos. And then obviously, what's in the box? 
What's in the box? I mean, that to me, top five greatest film scenes of all time. But that's just my my thoughts. Wow, you you put that really high up there. Oh, yeah, I think I think the reveal of that is really cool. Again, it goes into when the villain wins; it's it's impactful as hell, and having it be the lead up to the reveal of just having him walk into the police station with you know covered in blood. It's such a great reveal, and having him. It's very much like the Joker when you when you when not the villain not only wins but he turns the good guy bad. Oh my god. That's that's that is it's next level for sure. Yeah. You know it's interesting so I'm on, I'm on Google right now. Uh Usual Suspects came out about 6 months before 7. They both came out in 1995. Yeah. So That's speaking crazy. of the usual suspects, on my list was Kaiser Sose. I I love this movie. The way it was written and structured is so, so interesting. Having, you know, the character that turns out is the villain, is the bad guy, is the guy we're looking for. To be the one to tell the story about how to find him is so, so great and interesting. And... Right. I'll be honest, the first time I watched the movie, I was very young. I did watch it in the 90s. And I misunderstood it because I was only like seven. And I thought that Kobayashi, the lawyer, was Kaiser Sose. And when I went back to watch it when I was older, I was very confused when I realized I was wrong. (laughs) And that it was, spoilers, it was verbal Kent the whole time. But the, I mean, obviously, this movie is just really good, and it's a, it's a movie full of bad guys. But one bad guy has risen above to take them all down, and I I honestly don't even know necessarily what his motivation was. But uh-huh. in terms of being like the biggest baddie and getting one over not only on the other baddies and on various people as well, and the police officers and other government agencies i mean this dude is the most manipulative sob on the fucking planet and talk about character work this guy stayed in character as verbal kent now that's commitment to the bit i agree 100 <sighs> percent. sorry i had a cough there um okay. yeah there, I mean, Kevin, Sp- you know, once again, I just uh, these movies in general, I think, are all very they're all very well done. The performances are very well done. And what's interesting is most of the villains we've talked about thus far, including somebody who should be larger than life, like the Joker, they're all very grounded characters. They're all from more psychological elements. They're not menacing, 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 menacing menacing you know uh no i know that was a stumble on my words they're not menacing people that are trying to overtake the world that we've talked about you know they're not your uh, they're not Thanos. what's that yeah well they're not Thanos. We, we haven't gotten there yet but honestly all the ones that i wrote down on my list are all very realistic type villains you know some of which are slightly larger than life but we'll break we'll break them all down point being we're not sitting here talking about the Dr. Evils of the world. You know, there's so many movies where they have these larger than life characters that are all trying to take over the world. And it's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean you're going to be a great movie villain in the pantheon of film to where, you know, primal fear, the usual suspects, seven silence of the lambs, one flew of the cuckoo's nest offers very different takes. Very yeah, different. I'll go ahead and play the next message. Okay. Um, if you're talking about larger than life villains that are trying to take over the world, what about larger than life villains that are trying to take over the universe? Um, Darth Vader. <laughs> Classic villain. So I'm so glad you brought up Darth Vader for a multitude of reasons. Oh dear. We have talked. We have talked off air about Darth Vader because I assumed it would be on her list, and I nope. don't think she assumed it would be on my list. But such is life. Point being, you think I'm so basic? I never said you were basic. 
but you thought it never come out of my mouth. I may have insinuated <laughs> it, but I anyway. see you. I see you. I know you. See, I know. Your I know. Avatar's unblinking self. Yes. Uh. Anyways, the thing with Darth Vader is this. I get it. One hundred percent. If the original trilogy was all there was for Star Wars, definitely 100% Darth Vader would be on the list for me. I disagree. You disagree? I disagree. Okay. I but- don't think Darth Vader is a good villain. I think he's cool. Like the design. And uh, I mean, the voice, come on, James Earl Jones, let's go all day. But, you know, I don't have the darkness from Legend played by Tim Curry on my list, who's definitely, if we're talking coolest looking villains, it's him. Um, You know, Darth Vader, what was his motivation? Power. That's fucking boring. Like so many of these characters are just, I want power. I want money. I want more, more, more. That's fucking boring. That's why Hans Gruber isn't on my list. You know, it's just be something a little bit extra. Or, you know, be a, an unemotional, I'll get to that later, unemotional killing machine. Uh, you know, just to have a little bit more. Be Where's your nuance? It's, it's, very, it's very childish writing. But it's supposedly for children. Supposedly. So, I'll say this. The reality of it for me, when I was a small child and first started to watch the Star Wars movies, Darth Vader walked into the room and took all the air out of it. I've used that analogy before. He is a phenomenal villain as far as I'm concerned. What changed it for me was the prequel series because... Once you on, you know, it was very, how do I, how do I explain this? It was very black and white in the original trilogy, who the bad guys were and who the good guys were. There wasn't a lot of gray area. Obviously, as we learned more about Darth Vader throughout the original trilogy, you could understand a little bit of, okay, you know, he was once good and then he went to the dark side, blah, 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 blah. But once the original, once the prequels came out, It was very obvious, you know, he lived a long life being a hero and was basically just brainwashed by, you know, Palpatine and and some others to turn and become Darth Vader. But you even see at the very end of Return of the Jedi after he battles with Luke when he knows he's about to die that there was some sort of sense of redemption that he was trying to find even in his final moments. So on paper, Darth Vader will always be talked about as one of the greatest villains of all time, maybe the greatest villain of all time in pop culture, especially with the fact that now we've got Hayden Christensen returning to play Vader in the Obi-Wan series. To me, really solidifies Vader as easily one of the, most recognizable characters in film and now television. But I agree with you that doesn't make him a great villain at all. At all. Exactly. So those are my thoughts. Don't sue me. This is just a show. (laughs) All right. right, We've got some more messages to play. Yes, I will get on those with taps. I think I'm going to agree with Lego a little bit more. I think even in the original films, Darth Vader... His whole path is his supposed redemption, whether you want to accept it as a redemption or not. Because that was always Luke's mission, right? To redeem his father. Um, the the true villain, as we've seen now in the whole saga, is really Palpatine. So, yeah, I agree. I don't think Darth Vader's cool. And, and his stuff in, like, the books and the comics is probably a little bit more to make a better argument as, as a villain. But But movies in general, just the movies... Yeah, he's he wouldn't crack the you know the top list. Totally Say that to that. the internet because the internet will get all over you if you don't consider. Oh, 
I have a, a pretty funny breakdown where I try to figure out what the fuck Palpatine's plan was. I think it's pretty humorous. It can be found on uh, my Instagram if anyone is interested. What about actors in Hollywood who get tight cast to play nothing but villains and very slimy individuals that you don't want to be around and they do such a good job in that role um one actor that comes to mind that fits this to a t is david patrick kelly almost every role this guy gets in a hollywood movie he's playing a villain or just a real slime bag that you don't like um i mean I remember him in the the warriors the guy who shot cyrus Remember him in 48 Hours, he played Luther, that slime ball that you just wanted to see get whacked. He was also the uh, the gang leader in The Crow. Um, he was in Commando. He played a really slimy dude in Commando, a villain. And I remember, I, I love when Schwarzenegger dropped him off the cliff. I think he was also in The Longest Yard with Adam Sandler. He just played a friggin' snitch and a slime ball. Like, that guy does villainry very well. <laughs> I've got his uh, filmography pulled up. Not familiar with the name, but now that I see his face. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not pulling your face to the name, but fucking Commando is such a good movie. Sorry, I had to sideline that. I love Commando. Oh my God, I found, I found another thing that we agree on in life. This is, this, is a, this is a big win. Commando is phenomenal. Commando is one right? of the best Schwarzenegger movies ever, and it's not talked about enough. Hot take. Commando 100%. Is- Commando's better than Predator. Totally agree. Totally 100% agree. I knew we were friends for a reason. Come on. <laughs> oh, yes, Commando. Yes. Yes. Also, apparently this dude's in John Wick. He plays Charlie. I've never seen the John Wick movies, so I... You know. I love The Crow, but all I'm picturing is Fun Boy, so I'll have to go look it up later. Um, but speaking of Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll go ahead and go transition that into my next pick since it's relevant. Terminator movies. I mean, I'm going with the T-1000 who is played by Roger, um, Roger, Robert, Robert rather, Patrick. Patrick. Yes. So, but in the first Terminator movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger does a phenomenal job of playing the Terminator uh, who, in the obviously in the first film, the T-800 is the villain. Then we get to the uh, Terminator 2 where... He becomes the good guy and the T-1000 is the villain. But think of how fucking terrifying and relentless the T-1000 is. I mean, with the T-800, Kyle Reese tells Sarah Connor, it can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. So when that thing can't can't defeat the T-1000... Like, holy shit, how in the world can a young John Connor and Sarah Connor take out a guy that the T-800 can't take out? And Robert Patrick does such a good job. I mean, that dude's jawline is ridiculous on a side note. But very similar in that with, with Nurse Ratched in that it's a very expressionist role, or rather it's a very lack of expression role. Uh, his eyes are really communicating a death glare that I wish I could level up to more than anything. And the the abilities that the T-1000 has is of being like a liquid metal and able to transform into other people and mimic their voice. I mean, this is this is a relentless killing machine. It is it is ridiculous and such a cool and iconic villain for sure. 100% could not agree more. Silicona, Silicona. You know me, I have to do I have to do my Arnold. It's, it is what it is. Yeah, you might want to work on that one a little bit. <laughs> well, okay, all right. What, what's wrong with my Silicona? Is it it's too is it too deep? Is it too uh gravelly? No, you're just not getting the accent right. Silicona. Yeah, I don't you're know. You're sounding is... like British and, and not a good British either. <laughs> <laughs> not Australian. Oh, we go all over the place on this show. Um, yeah, so those were all really interesting messages. I think we've covered some things. Oh, we got another one to play. I'll hit the play button this time. All right. Hello, just swiped onto your conversation. I think the greatest movie villain 
is the child snatcher in um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That dude freaks me the fuck out. Every, even now, I'm 28 years of age, and he creeps me out. He still creeps me out. He takes me right back to my childhood, and he scares the shit out of me. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's him for me. Uh, full disclosure, I've not seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang since I was about five or six years old. Lego, have you seen it in the last 20 years? I have not. So I have a hard time remembering it. I'm definitely going to go. I, I already got a Google marked on my thing to go check out that movie again at some point. Uh, love the opinion. Definitely. I'm sure when whenever the word child, whenever the word child snatcher is used, automatically yeah. makes the bad boys list makes the bad I, the bad villains list that made me think of one i definitely did not have on my list but is definitely an interesting character that's kind of out of the blue in a character in a movie that almost doesn't seem fitting but it's i'm completely blanking on the actor's name and i know i know it uh it's the gentleman in con air who is in like the hannibal lecter kind of get up you talking, actor. About, you talking about Cyrus the Virus? Steve Buscemi. Uh, Steve yes. Buscemi. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Buscemi's character in, in Con Air is very unsettling, especially since it's Steve Buscemi. Yeah, he plays uh, Garland Green. That's uh, that's the character from his character from Con Air. Con Air, yeah. one of the greatest movies ever made. Severely underrated. <laughs> Yeah. It's so How fun. I, I love, I love action you. 90s action movies. They're yeah. so fun. It's so good. With Dave Chappelle falling out of an airplane, you've got John Malkovich, the whole gang, Monica Potter, Nicholas yeah. Cage, John Cusack is John phenomenal. Cusack is what I was about to say. Yes, yes, yes. John Cusack, always, always a good time. All right. Uh, who's up? Yeah, Maybe. Rob, what's another one of your picks? Oh, whoa, slow your roll, bud. Um, we're going to go with do, 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 Antoine Chigurh. Oh, thanks. Uh, Antoine Chigurh from No Country for Old Men, the 2007 film that won Best Picture by the Coen brothers. It is a masterpiece of a performance. I've, so here's the thing. So I worked at the movie theater when this movie came out and I remember it came out like early fall. And I got done working one day and the movie was about to start and I was dying to see it because I love the Coen brothers, love Tommy Lee Jones, right? I didn't really know anything about Javier Bardem yet or Josh Brolin, but was sold on the movie. And I went and watched it and I watched the whole movie and was like, all right, it's kind of typical Coen brothers fair. It's not, it, it you know, they keep, they kind of keep that same pulse, that same tone throughout the whole movie. It was, it was good. I liked it. And then it kind of, you know, like certain things do, it kind of festered with me over the course of the next week. And I was like, I need to watch this movie again because it really kind of settled with me and was like, man, those performances were out of this world. So I rewatched it at theater again after I got done working one day and was like, this is such a weird movie because it's not. There's all this stuff going on. It's not like really nobody at my high school is talking about this movie where they were talking about, you know, big franchises or whatever. It it's kind of seems to be like under the radar, whatever. So I say all that to say this, you know, obviously it wins best picture, yada, yada, yada. Now it's on cable TV or uh, like HBO or whatever, you know, the, the cable premium channels. And I rewatched it again that summer. And was just like, man, every time I watch this movie, I fall in love with it even more. It's it's just the performances. It's whatever heavy Lego. I've seen this movie legitimately like eight times all the way through at this point. And every time I watch it, it goes higher up on my list as one of my favorite films of all time. Javier Bardem is so, you know, he's so creepy and scary and menacing and he's very realistic as a real threat and a real killer and the reason i think it works so well is like anthony hopkins 
he's not, he doesn't like jump out and go, ha, I'm Hannibal Lecter. You know, he just plays a creep. Kevin Spacey in seven. He doesn't jump out and go, ah, I'm, I'm John Doe. He just plays this psychological, crazy creep mastermind. Same thing with Nurse Ratchet. Same thing with Mr. Potter. All the characters that we've talked about. That's exactly what goes on in this movie. He's one of the greatest villains ever, yet he's not, like I've said before, overdoing it. There's not this like overdone aspect to, you know, make him out to be this villain. But if you watch the movie, you go, yeah, this is this is top level. And I'm going to talk about another person that's like that later on on my list that does a very similar thing. It's very subtle, but it just it works. It works very well. Have you seen No Country for Old Men? No. Yeah, highly recommend that one. I shrug. Uh, shrug. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and play these messages. Okay, this may be a weird one. Even I don't know if I obscure, but McKellar Cole in in The Good Son, where he plays opposite of yes. Elijah Wood. Uh man, that kid, like big villain, like just. I know the movie's not probably the best, but he just really played as a bad dude, even though he's just a little kid. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't. I don't know if that's on anybody's list. Oh yeah, kids are terrifying, and Macaulay Culkin in The Good Son trying to take out Elijah Wood, freaky as hell. T- t- totally agree. That should be a horror movie. I don't know if it's considered one or not. Or like the little boy in Pet Cemetery. That that. That child is nightmare fuel. Kids are terrifying. Why do people have them? Oh, <laughs> uh, I you know, I don't know, but it I've never seen I've never seen that movie. So I really can't weigh in on it. Oh, oh of course you wouldn't have. Never mind. But uh yes, I I I really like a Mac Culkin's performance in The Good Son. I would love Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood to get together and recreate the movie as adults. That would be iconic <laughs> oh were they kids when this movie came out yeah yeah they were little kids i mean this is right after this is right it would have been right after uh home alone and to see him going into the next movie as being a little child murderer must have been something else interesting yeah yeah he was he was not getting typecast okay, okay. let's play the next message <laughs> yeah um Commando better than Predator? I mean, I'm a Schwarzenegger fan to the fullest and I love all his films, but that's debatable. Um, I can see why you would say that. I guess it just depends on what side of the fence you are, you're on. Um, With that being said, I mean, the Predator itself made for a pretty compelling villain, extraterrestrial that comes to Earth to make trophies of man. also, I think like the xenomorph from Aliens is a very, very terrifying uh, villain as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah 100%. See, xenomorphs are scary. I think xenomorphs are way freakier than Predator. I mean, face huggers, chest bursters, just their names are weird. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, for sure. Uh, so let, let's have this debate real quick. This is my this is my thing. So I rewatched. I've seen Predator probably like three or four times all the way through. When quarantine first hit last year, I rewatched it. The first month, everybody likes to likes to uh, rip on Rob. Rob, you don't watch any movies. It's like, listen, I spent twenty eight years watching movies all the time. When COVID first hit, I watched a shitload of movies, and then I just kind of fell off with it. And I, you know, now I'm trying to catch back up, but. I rewatched Predator and it's, it's a building movie. It's there's, you know, there's the mission and then it slowly builds up similar to alien. Okay. Whereas commando for me, commando just right out of the gate. It's just like, all right, we're getting right into it. Doing the thing. Remember when I said I was going to kill you last? I lied. It's so, it's like, Oh, commando all day commando. But that's just my opinion. And then the xenomorphs, the xenomorphs, did you put those on your list, or you said no? Because horror, right? 
Correct, but they they would be they they would be really high. Okay, okay, I can dig it. All okay, right. what, what do we got next? I'm gonna okay, go. I'm going to play his last message. But speaking of Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone, um, another actor, again who typically gets typecast as villains and does it very well, is uh, yeah. Joe Pesci. Um, played an excellent villain in Home Alone with a comedic side, but when he plays serious roles like in Casino, um, yeah, man, his villainry is is uh, amazing. I mean, his role as Tommy DeVito in Goodfellas. I wrote it down on my list as greatest movie villains because it it iconic is an understatement. Totally agree. Totally, totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, and he, and he, it, it, it's stressful. <laughs> oh, I, so I find his character stressful. He's very stressful. You yeah. know, funny how. But what about like female villains? I mean, we. I haven't heard much about that so far in the discussion. Like I remember um, Sharon Stone's performance in Basic Instinct. Um, yeah. She played a really good villain in that film. Also, um, I forget the actress's name, but the one who was in Misery. Um, yes. She was a really, really good villain in that movie. Um, I'm pretty sure that there are other female villains out there that did really good, uh, really good in their roles. I just have to like sit down and contemplate over which films I've seen, and I don't know, maybe come back at you guys later on. Annie Wilkes is on my list, and actually most of the rest of my list are females. <laughs> okay, interesting, because uh, I was okay. Googling female villains, so why don't you take the lead on that one? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go with Annie Wilkes from Misery, and holy shit, did she make me afraid to drive in the mountainside. <laughs> So, of, of course, we hopefully have all known what Misery is about. It's a pretty prolific story. Riders driving, and he gets into a car accident. One of his fans drives him back to her house to nurse him back to health and also keep him hostage and force him to write another novel. It's every writer's nightmare. Definitely. Anyway, she's crazy, and she breaks his legs in the movie, in the book. I think she might have cut them off. It gets dark. Stephen King did a lot of cocaine. <laughs> uh, yeah, and she's terrifying. I'm completely blanking on the actress's name. but she's, Kathy Bates. She, Kathy Bates, thank you. She is a fucking amazing in everything she's in. The unsinkable Molly Brown. Oh, yeah. Love About her. And she, Rat race. I, she's uh, Kathy Bates is always she's just bringing her game. for sure. And in terms of of Annie Wilkes, they did season two of Castle Rock on Hulu is centered around her character, and I totally recommend it. They did such a such such a good job of capturing just the intensity that is Annie Wilkes. She's like this this really seemingly you know kind i would say almost like midwestern type of of woman that is just outside of sanity not even looking in <laughs> uh question does kathy bates play her in castle rock no no, no. um i don't know what the name is of the castle actor. rock Castle Rock is a TV show that is basically like an amalgamation of various Stephen King ideas. It's set in Castle Rock, Maine, which is one of the fictional towns in, in Stephen King's Maine. It has a lot of ideas from his various books, and it references them. It, it's kind of like a spinoff Stephen King story. Uh, it created by J.J. Abrams, and it's on Hulu. I think it's just two seasons. It's it's totally interesting. Bill Scars, a lot of really great actors are in it. They have you know Sissy Spacek is in the first season. Bill Skarsgård's in the first season. Uh, they have David Selby. They had a waste of a David Selby, which I find very problematic. How are you going to waste a David Selby like that? Uh, the second season has like Tim Robbins and yeah, yeah. It's got a lot of very, very recognizable famous actors who've appeared in various Stephen King uh, adaptations throughout the years. There's a lot of references to like, uh, uh, oh my God, what's it called? Shawshank, the prison. 
uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it references a lot of the movies and a lot of the the things that have gone on in various Stephen King's books. Interesting. And that's been my pitch for you to watch Castle Rock. <laughs> I'm looking at the cast right now. This is uh, Jackie Torrance is in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Oh, Lizzie Kaplan plays Annie Wilkes. Okay. That's interesting. Yes. yes Very yes. interesting. Yeah, honestly, I've heard of the show, but I've never seen it. All right. Uh, well, I'll throw out... I've got a few left, and you said you've got a lot, so I'll throw out a couple of mine real quick. Let's go with... And this is a very specific performance for me. Many... I don't... Don't ask me why. I can talk James Bond all fucking day long. Sun up to oh, sundown. Dear. Don't ask me why they could never just get the same actor to play Blofeld in the movies. So many different actors have played this character it is fucking ridiculous okay some of which with hair and then some of which without hair too it just makes no sense at all but where i'm going with this is the 1969 severely underrated but now i think because it has aged like a fine wine and is one of the less creepy bond films oh god it's actually starting to get the recognition that it fully deserves 1969's on her majesty's secret service service the one-off with George Lazenby playing James Bond. Telly Savalas played Blofeld in this version and is knocking it out of the park. 10 out of fucking 10. Absolutely phenomenal. Once again, this isn't a Blofeld take over the world sort of film. It's more of a human piece on James Bond finding his wife, Tracy, played by the late Diana Rigg. Spoiler alert, she is murdered at the end of the film. It's one of the greatest James Bond movies. It's always been one of my favorite Bond movies. And the performance of Telly Savalas in this version of Blofeld works on every level as far as I'm concerned. So it's definitely more of the humanistic, uh, one of the more humanistic versions of a James Bond movie as well. That is my rant on 007. <laughs> well, cool, cool, cool. I, I don't like the James Bond movie, so I don't I know. know. I'll take your word I for know. it. I know. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and transition into my next pick, which is probably one of the most iconic movie villains of all time, which would be the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. Oh, is she? Yeah. The most fantastic villain? No. Is she one of the most interesting villains? I say yes. This witch, this poor woman, Elphaba, if you will, her sister, the Wicked Witch of the East, is murdered by this red-headed intruder with a little dog from Kansas. Then this monster, Dorothy, has the audacity to steal the shoes off her sister. What kind of monster robs their victims? It's horrendous. And poor Elphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West, then just trying to get re some revenge for her murdered sibling is sending her flying monkeys out to go get this the shoes back from Dorothy. And Dorothy, what she do? She throws water on her. What kind of jerk brat creature no no in fact no. i think i'm starting to argue that maybe dorothy's the villain after all is she maybe poor alphaba what a what a quote air quotes villain we can all relate to who wouldn't want revenge for their little sister getting a house dropped on them and then robbed just the cruelty, the cruelty, Rob. 
But also the character, I mean, yes, it's over the top. It's silly. But this is a character, a villain that I think so many people are introduced to when they're children. It's one of the first villains that any of us see in film. And uh, obviously it's one of the most famous movies ever. And she's one of the most famous villains ever. And I 100% recommend reading the series. I'm completely blanking on the name. Holy shit. (laughs) Um, The the Wizard of Oz book series? No, no, no. Not the Wizard of Oz. The spinoff. It's a fucking famous as hell Broadway show. Wicked, oh, Wicked, the Wicked series. I I would recommend reading the Wicked series. It's it's very good, and I really love how they go in depth into her backstory. It's very it's awesome. Well, that's great. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. So growing up, the Wicked Witch of the West, The Wizard of Oz was one of my favorite movies. Uh, yeah. still still is, I guess, but I haven't seen it in a very long time. The Wicked Witch of the West gave me legit like the 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 monkeys gave me like legitimate nightmares as a child it was a whole thing but yes fantastic 100 percent through and through we've got a few messages to play let's break them down now uh all right i'm gonna throw out one of mine real quick i mean okay you're gonna get mad oh I no know. i can oh I no can, i can feel it i just know uh, coming out in 1988 from 20th Century Fox, one of the greatest movies ever made with one of the greatest villains and one of the greatest performances by Alan Rickman. That is Hans uh. Gruber from Die Hard, directed by John McTiernan. Uh, I know I'm just spewing facts out about this movie because I fucking love Hans Gruber. Hans Gruber is the only person that made my list that is, well, other than Blofeld, kind of, who is trying to take over the world and be a terrorist and all of that stuff. That's it's not even flawed. what he was trying to do. He was, it was for political reasons. What? Did you watch the movie? <laughs> Die Hard? Yes. Yeah, he's trying to get he's trying to get No, money. he wasn't. Oh my god. Have you actually seen this movie? Are you being serious right now? I hope you're joking. Is this April Fool's joke? I wish I could say it was. I can't even look at you. It's a good thing this is an audio show. Are you kidding me? Oh my god! Oh my god! No, okay. I don't believe I have to explain his plan to you. (laughs) So, they have all these people come in and they're trying to rob the building, right? Right. But they don't want anyone to know what their actual plan is. So they're pretending they tell everybody to be terrorists. Yeah. Oh my god. But I, I, I mean, like your yes, is... your car is officially revoked. <laughs> I mean, yes, that is credit correct. card it's, revoked. It's one of those. Watch this hand while the other hand does something else. But it's obvious, right? But what there's okay. What they're really doing? Yes, that that is correct. I I know that. But I think you are saving I, face, sir. It is not, not working. Face. I think the reason that I got confused was because what they're telling everybody that they're doing is what it's what the public knows. Does that make sense? All the characters in the movie think that they're there for these reasons. This quote unquote, like, you know, we're this terrorist organization. So where they're really just bank robbers that are pretending to be terrorists. I understand that. Rob, but, Rob, Rob. What? what? Shame on you. No, not no shame on me. It's the same. It's yes. the same. No, but I, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, <laughs> they are, they are perceiving themselves to be terrorists. So that's why they make my my list of the only the only people that are on this, the only person that's on this list that's one of those quote unquote take over the world bad guys. And you can't tell me that there's Rob. A you were, between... you were, you were, no, <laughs> no credit card revoked. 
Credit card revoked. <laughs> ripped up, burned, the ashes spread over the bay. Yeah. Oh. oh. I've seen Darwin oh like God. 25 times. <laughs> I'm playing this message, dude. Oh, yeah. Can't forget Christoph Waltz. Um, his portrayal as the Jew hunter in Inglorious Bastards. Um, that opening scene in the cabin with the milk. Oh my God, what a tense scene. And he pulled off that character amazingly. Like, oh my gosh, what a good villain in that film. I think he won an Oscar for that, if I'm not mistaken. He did win an Oscar for that. That, that was actually the last person on my list. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, that scene, the whole performance is 10 out of 10 phenomenal. Christoph Waltz all fucking day. We're going to get back to him in a minute, though. We need to finish up this Hans Gruber conversation. Okay. Let me rephrase what I was saying. In the, in, on my list, I had made a very, I'm going to, because I'm going to defend myself. I said most of these people are like realistic, low key, you know, performances. They're creeps, they're psychological, et cetera, et cetera. Said they're Hans Gruber is the one kind of mastermind take over the world person that I've got. And I just got ripped a new asshole for it. (laughs) And for good reason, as is always, because when I get my ass chewed out, it's not unwarranted 10 out of 10 (laughs) times. So yes, my bad credit card revoked, torn up, thrown into the ashes in the, the bowels of hell. I've seen Die Hard 25 times. I'm I am a huge movie fan, but Lego was right. It doesn't count as a take over the world person. So there's that. Did we lose you? Are you still there? Did are you, she leave? Are you, did she, are you, did she finally leave me? <laughs> she <gone? laughs> Have you defended yourself adequately? Yes, I'm just waiting for the day where like we're supposed to do it, and you're just like, I'm out. I'm not coming back. Oh, I wouldn't do that on audio. I would do it if there was visual. Oh yeah, well that would be a great that would be great broadcasting because everybody would love that moment where you just. Leave. It would be fantastic. The empty chair of sadness. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so Christoph Waltz and Glorious Bastards. I, I mean, you said it. It's 100%. It is one of the creepiest, like, most intense scenes ever in a movie. The intro to that, the whole performance is phenomenal. It, to, to me, that was the first time I ever really saw anything with Christoph Waltz. So was just like, who is this guy? He's going to be, like, the next Anthony Hopkins. And he's shaping up to be so. I honestly don't remember that movie. I saw it once when it came out. <laughs> In, really? Tarantino? Inglorious Passage? Yeah, that's just, just, I don't know. Not your, not your jam? I love, I love me a Tarantino movie, but that one was just kind of like, eh, I saw it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then I went to watch uh, another weird one of his movies, as I do. Uh, we got a message to play. I'm going to play this real quick, and then we'll get back to you, Lego. Um, I have to side with Rob on this. Um, Hans Gruber makes for a very compelling villain. Oh, um, should I get into I this? I think more so because of Alan Rickman's uh, depth in acting. Like, he brought that villain to life. Um, and it's one of his best performances, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I might get my credit card revoked as well, but you know what? It is what it is. Oh, no, no, no. Rob got his credit card revoked because he didn't know the plot of the movie. <laughs> it's, there's nothing wrong with thinking that, you know, he's a good villain. That's totally that's totally cool. Um, and his, I mean, obviously, Alan Rickman was such a good actor. And he portrayed, I think that was his first movie. And he portrayed this character with such fucking gravitas. It was, I mean, in terms of like perfect casting for a role, that's it. And in terms of like act, you know, masterclass of acting, that's it. However, in terms of uh, being a villain, 
I mean, he didn't win. He fell off a fucking building. His plan was cool, but ultimately totally fucking failed because of a barefoot, bloodied up, lone cowboy, quote, uh, air quotes, because it's actually cop, but you get the reference, hopefully, you know, with the yippee ki and all that. It's funny because oh. I explained it. Anywho. <laughs> Uh, Come to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. I knew you were going to say that. You quote that so much. Uh, So anyway, yeah, he, he, in terms of being an actual villain, I mean, he's kind of sub- Par, not on, on in any way, shape, or form because of Alan Rickman. That's on part of the writing because that movie is for the hero. It's not for the villain. Facts. All right, we have to move on after to, we have to get past this diehard hurdle. It's uh, uh, we're, we're we're done with the Lego rants. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Uh, I've wrapped up my list. Are there a few left that you'd like to get through before we get out of here today? For sure. Uh, well, we got to go HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Okay. I mean, he's just an unsettling fucking red dot. Like, how, how do you have an unsettling red dot? It's a red dot. That shouldn't be so terrifying, and yet it is. The fact that they were able to make that that red light and that voice, you know, the good morning, Dave, terrifying. The, you got to give him credit. That was very well freaking done. Technology is always scary. And that's just a fact. Yeah, totally. I've so. All right. This are is you not are you not a Kubrick fan? Oh, uh, me and Stanley. Me and Stanley. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear God. Have I seen all of Stanley's movies? Yes, I have. Do I appreciate them for what they, what they're, what they are and what they're for? Yes, I do. Do I think Clockwork Orange is a masterpiece? Yes. Do I think Full Metal Jacket's entertaining? Yes. Uh, the Shining, I need to rewatch because it's been too long. I've mm-hmm. seen 2001 A Space Odyssey twice. The first time, I hated it. I was like 13 and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, wh- were they on drugs when they made this movie? And then I rewatched it again when I was like 20 while I was on drugs. And I was oh my like, God. this movie is so much better when you're high. Oy vey. But I will say this. I have heard from a few people that if you go see it in the theater, uh, my friend Ben uh, said this and so a few other people that I know. If you go see it in the theater, that it's a it's quite the experience. I've seen it in theaters twice, and it absolutely is. Uh, I sat at the very very front row in a, a Dolby theater, and it what? was why would you sit was, in the front row? I wanted to be in the movie, and I, I always was. Sit, I always sit dead center, all the way in the back, all the way up top, dead center in the theater. That I way. used to do that, but now yeah. it's it's fun to be like in the fucking movie, especially in a Dolby, which has you know the best speakers. It's too much ever. to look at. It, that's like, the point. You got to move your <laughs> overwhelm like time, me with your art. I sat third row for the, my first showing of Endgame because you know went opening night, and I saw it you know the next day and in a better seat. But it was too much. You're too close. It was the same. That was the reason I didn't like Avatar. When I saw Avatar in the theater, I was like, it's too much. It's too much movie. Sit back. I just, just, just put me in the movie. Immerse me. Bring me in. Fill me up. And, and just overwhelm my senses. Let me be one with the illusion. Exactly. All right. What else you got? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and play this message real quick first. Oh, yeah. Um, another villain I'm going to bring up. Um, I don't know if you may agree or disagree with me on this, but I think it deserves a, deserves a mention. Um, Dolph Lundgren's perfa- portrayal of Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. Um, <laughs> I mean, when you look at what was happening within society when that movie came out and the propaganda that that movie was trying to promote... And then you have Ivan Drago, this seemingly unstoppable killing machine who uh, 
killed Apollo Creed. I mean, everybody in the theater was crying when Apollo Creed died in the ring. Like, I remember that vividly. If he dies, he dies. Um, he played that role really, really well. Yep. That's all you, Rob. <laughs> so, Rocky IV, um, the, in my opinion, second worst Rocky movie after what is the terrible film Rocky Five. I, I mean, I, I know I'm I know I'm referencing an old bit that some people might might know that I'm referencing that are listening to this show. But I mean really like you couldn't get an ad deal, like you couldn't get a sponsorship. Biggest boxer on the planet in the fictional world of Rocky Balboa, he was as big as Muhammad Ali. You're telling me you couldn't get him a deal with Haynes underwear? He was broke, and they had to move back into that little house. Are you fucking kidding me? No, movie's terrible. Rocky IV, however, I've stated this a thousand times. I think Ivan Drago is a great villain. He murders one of the awesomest characters in movies, which is one Apollo Creed. Rocky IV is a movie, though. A, Bill Conti didn't do the score to that one, so Doc points there. B, it's basically just a training montage for an hour and a half. There's no plot. And then Stallone just grows this wicked ass beard and goes running through the through the snowy woods in Russia. Oh, I could talk about Rocky Four all day. I'm really excited though, and I don't know why Stallone decided to do this, but Stallone's working on a director's cut of Rocky Four that I'm really excited about because. Stallone usually can't do no wrong when he's really invested in a project. Let's let's be honest. I mean, 2008's Rambo, oh, so good, so good. I'll take your word for it. I know. I know. All right, what else you got? Um, did you have anything else on your list? No, I've pretty much covered all of my big ones. And, uh, you know, I figured a lot of the ones that have gotten brought up would get brought up. The only one I will say, I guess, that I'll throw on there is Thanos. Because, I mean, does it really need to be explained how great Josh Brolin was as Thanos? No, it does not. He was very good in the role of Thanos. All right, Indeed. what do you got? Um, I mean, I've pretty much covered my list other than this is not one of the best ones. It's just just honorable mention to Julian Beck as Kane in Poltergeist 2, which might be one of the most, to me, like unsettling fucking portrayals in a movie. Yeah. It, yeah, that dude was just... Scary. And I feel bad because now when I got older, because as a kid, he terrified me and I got older and I realized, oh, he was actually just like very sickly at the time and he died before the movie even came out. Um, so I'm kind of a bad person for thinking that. And, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, children's movies like Scar from Lion King and Mother Gothel from Tangled, um, Professor Umbridge from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. But you know, Corella DeVille, but what I really feel like we should leave off with, and I really want to communicate this, you know, to the, to the, any listeners or people at large. And as is, you know, necessary for me to bring up per my contract, Christian from Midsummer. <laughs> Christian from Midsummer is definitely the villain of the movie. That little punk, I'm not, he did not deserve what happened to him at the end. However, he was a douchebag. Know it to be true. I, uh, you know, can't say this enough. Don't like the movie Midsummer. Sorry, I keep bringing it up, but I fucking love it. It's okay. I'm going to keep bringing up James Bond and all the other stuff you don't like as well. I need to rewatch Midsummer. I just think I went into the movie. I was high and I watched it. It was like, what the fuck is this? This is like Phantom Thread level boring or uh, Roma level boring. And yeah, 
but maybe I should rewatch it because everybody, all all my cool art friends, tell me it's it's a great movie. So I concur with them. But you're one of them. Oh. <laughs> All right, we got a message to play. Oh. Um, I wanted, I just wanted to bring up like villains that were fun to watch. Uh, you know, during the, that time in the eighties, uh, when you just had fun villains. So, with that being said, um, Biff Tannen from Back to the <laughs> <Thank> Future, <laughs> fun villain to watch. Also, okay, uh, Johnny Lawrence and uh, Sensei Crease from The Karate Kid. You just, okay. you just got, you just got her really excited. Yes, you got her. Uh, okay, really well, obviously, excited. I don't know why I said obviously, but hi, Back to the Future is my favorite movie, and I love F. Paul Wilson as Biff Tannen and Buford, aka Mad Dog Tannen and Griff Tannen, depending on which movie we're watching. Old Biff, young Biff, I like them all. Really old Biff. He's fantastic. However, if you watch Back to the Future and if you pay close attention, you will notice Biff is in fact not the villain of the story. Although he was based on uh, a certain, you know, 45th quote president. So obviously he was evil. I'm not disputing his evilness. I'm just saying he's not the villain of the story. One, Doc Emmett Brown is the villain of Back to the Future. Yes, that's right. I said it, and it's How true. Is that? I'm happy to explain. Let's go back, way back when. So, Doc uh, was a professor at the University, uh, or not the University of California, somewhere along those lines. I can't recall off the top of my head. Anyway, he gets recruited to work the Manhattan Project during World War II, where he helps create Fat Man and Little Boy, the two atomic bombs that were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. August 1945. Okay, so, cut to, he then becomes a professor at a college near Hill Valley University. His mother, uh, I can't remember her name, El- Mrs. Ellsworth, I believe, she okay. gets engaged to a man. She's very wealthy. Of course, we know they live at 1640 Riverside Drive, which is a mansion. They come from wealth. So he, being very concerned for his mother, takes a large sum of money from her and buries it, which Marty's uncle, Uncle Jailbird Joey, is accused of stealing, and that's why he's in prison. Blom. Yes, that's right. He pinned it on him. He took the money, and he used it to start um, funding his experiments. Then, of course, his mother died. He gets the house. He burns the house down. Possibly because of an experiment. Possibly not. I'm not here to make that, you know, those accusations at anyone. I'm just stating facts. House burned down. That's why he lives in the garage, which is now on Kennedy Drive. Okay, so we know he's doing all these things. Then he goes to work for some Libyan terrorist where he changed out the uh, plutonium for used pinball machine parts to build them a, quote, bomb. End air quotes. Right. So now he's got all this money he's used to fund his experiments. And he's got these very, very dangerous radioactive, you know, uh, elements so that he can get a DeLorean and make it a time machine with a flux capacitor, which he came up with September 5th, uh, 1955. And then we start going to the future. And what happens when we start time traveling? Oh, yeah. We start fucking things up. That's right. Doc Brown is the villain. And I would say maybe he learns his lesson in 1885 after he gets stuck there in the third film. But no, because then at the end, even after he's told Marty that we shouldn't meddle in time, destroy the DeLorean, and Marty does this when the train hits it, he reconverts Locomotive 131 into another fucking time machine. He didn't learn his lesson. He goes back to 1985 with Claire and their sons, Jules and Byrne. And those kids aren't little. They're not babies. They're like 9 and 10. He's been time traveling. He's been messing with time still. And did you notice how many different forms of money he had when he came back to get Marty and take him to 2015 to help him with his children and to pin 
their crimes on poor Griff Tannen, who's had a lot of family troubles because of them? Man, he had a lot. He's been time traveling to at least, uh, I forgot, eight other time periods. It's ridiculous. Oh, and did I mention another way that he funded his time travel? He went back to 1938 and got himself some first issues of Superman comics and ensured their others were missing and destroyed so that they would be very valuable when he came back. That's right. He fucked up Superman for us. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I really like Back to the Future. <laughs> Wow. Did I talk too fast? No, that was a great rant. That's totally a clip out right there, buddy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I go crazy when it comes to the Back to the Future. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I love it. It's All like right. On that note, <laughs> I uh, need to go make more coffee. The struggle is real today, folks. We're I don't think I should here. touch coffee for the rest of the day. <laughs> We're going to get out of here. Thank you all for joining us once again here. Uh, all that being said, where can the people find you at, Lego? Anything you'd like I to I can plug? be found on all the social media pl platforms at Legoland13, specifically YouTube. I'm trying to put out more stuff that's hopefully interesting to the people. I should be doing a review of uh, the first four episodes of Invincible this week. As well as I am doing some more <laughs> Back to the Future theories that anybody is interested in a crazy person. Also, I will be on Rob's channel at the top of the hour following the newest episodes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, as he already explained. Hell yeah. And you can find me all over the damn place at Rob Fishback and on Instagram at Rob underscore Fishback. Bug me on there. Ask me about what we're up to. I've got all sorts of things in the works. I have been doing great shows over on my channel that uh, I've really been excited about building all sorts of things and really getting into this whole broadcasting YouTube world as somebody who has played music for a living up until COVID and then found himself sitting around with no gigs. It's a uh, crazy world, but we're here to uh, make it work. All right, everybody, Lego, always a pleasure. I'm sure I'll talk to you within the next couple of hours because we've got all kinds of things to plan. Everybody, have a great day. Stay safe. Be well. Remember to fluff your pillows. Don't flush your pillows. And uh, check your internet. Blow on it first. And remember right. that zoos are evil. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Later. <laughs>